It is July of 2001. On the Kamchatka Peninsula, companies of T-80 battle tanks prepare to defend the Tagilski coastline. With the beta threat having spread across the continent of Eurasia, the Far Eastern Front is all that stands between them and the last vestiges of Soviet territory. As with every front of the war, it is an embattled region subject to constant incursions by the endless swarms of Beta. On July 9th, Beta Group D emerges from the Evansk Hive and enters the Sea of Okhotsk. Sixty hours later, the patrol boat Korsakov detects the large-scale herd moving across the seabed of the Gulf of Shelikov. They would arrive on the shores of western Kamchatka in force. With battle-hardened troops, the Soviet army had already arrayed its defenses in preparation for the landing, and upon its approach, the Beta Group was met with depth charges, underwater mines, and naval gunfire. When that failed to deter them from making landfall, barrages of rockets and self-propelled artillery hammered the emerging foe. Soviet armor units advanced into firing positions and decimated the Beta in a deadly crossfire. Fighting within the center of the defense line were the 184th Tank Company and the Akura Tank Company, both of which engaged and destroyed countless medium and larger strains of Beta. Enemy losses were as predicted, and it seemed the battle would soon be winding down. At the A-04 observation post, immediately behind the battle line, a series of vibrational waveforms had gone undetected. The constant artillery fire in the area of operations had masked all seismic sensor readings. Only when it was too late did the soldiers manning the post realize the danger they were in. The earth suddenly gave way beneath them, swallowing the observation post in a swarm of beta. The forward defense line was cut off, and the beta were now rapidly spreading behind it. What had earlier been a routine defensive operation and now become an absolute crisis for the Soviet forces. Immediately in the path of this emerging swarm was the 718th Rocket Regiment, who were quickly set upon by a herd of grappler class Beta. The 211th Tactical Armor Battalion, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Fikatsia Latrova, immediately responded, engaging the Beta in sporadic fighting at the rear. The front lines remained caught in a pincer, however, still far out of the reach of Soviet TSFs, which had all been held in reserve. Akula Tank Company was immediately surrounded, and the 184th Tank Company soon realized they would be overtaken as well. In chaos and unable to retreat, they were forced to push forward into the Beta in front of them. This would bring them into deadly close quarters combat against numerous grappler, destroyer, and tank class Beta. In the rear lines, the rapidly expanding subterranean swarm continued to destroy observation posts and support units, advancing as far as the 37th Rocket Regiment's position and overrunning them as well. Losses were rapidly mounting as TSF battalions attempted to stabilize the rear positions. The Akula Tank Company and many other armored units beside them were wiped out without even the slightest hope for escape. The 184th conducted a desperate maneuver turning their tanks toward a gap and attempting a breakout before they too could be caught in the encirclement. With only five T-80s left, they reached a considerable distance before all their tanks were either destroyed or disabled. Many other tank companies endured similar predicaments at all positions across the Tagilski region. Yet as the crews of the 184th could hear smaller strains of Beta now eating their way through the holes of their tanks, they were surprised to suddenly hear the roar of TSF engines descending from the skies. The 211th had finally managed to break through to them and began engaging the surrounding Beta. Securing an escape route for any remaining T-80s, the battle-hardened Tsar Battalion quickly turned the tide in favor of Soviet forces once again. Latrova detached one of her squadrons to rescue the crews of disabled tanks while the rest of her TSFs led a counterattack into the enemy lines. All other remaining units, having had enough room to regroup, were immediately ordered to force the Beta back. Both incursions were destroyed at a large loss of life. This was the reality 
of the constant fighting along the Soviet front. The forward base commander, Major General Balakin, made efforts to shore up the weakened defense line in the aftermath of the battle. His requests for additional tanks and replacement crews were heard by the Soviet Communist Party, but went unanswered. The means to effectively collapse the massive beta tunnels directly behind their defense was also never provided. Meanwhile, across the sea, the United Nations had begun the process of organizing an expeditionary unit for deployment into Kamchatka. This unit, however, was not intended to serve as reinforcements for the Soviet troops. The United Nations Third Force operated out of Yukon Base in Alaska, along the borders between the U.S.-held region and the Soviet Least Territory to the north. The Third Force made its primary contribution to the war effort through the testing and development of prototype TSFs using personnel and resources from countries all over the world. This program was known as Project Prominence. At Kamchatka, the Project Prominence commander, Colonel Klaus Hartwick, hoped to conduct live combat trials for several of Yukon Base's TSF and weapons development programs. The Soviet leadership itself was quick to assure the UN that their presence along the Far East Front would be welcomed with enthusiasm and support. With its relative distance to Alaska, Kamchatka was ideally positioned to allow for the UN to ferry troops and establish an effective line of logistics. Political and corporate backers of Project Prominence began contributing resources to the expedition in earnest. Yet the momentum their support created would inadvertently prevent UN troops from receiving an adequate amount of time to conduct readiness training before the deployment. In spite of this, and with the reassurances of the Soviet Union, six development teams were selected to deploy over the course of two separate phases. The first phase of the UN expedition would consist of deploying three test flights from the Middle East, Europe, and the African Union into Kamchatka. Deploying at a later date, the second phase would consist of three separate test flights. These teams would consist of the Baofeng test flight, representing the United Front of China, the Soviet Central Strategic Development Corps' EDAL test flight, representing the Soviet Union, and the multinational XFJ program, a joint U.S.-Japan project operating the Argus test flight. With the convenience of these tests soon to be taking place, the Imperial Japanese requested the field test of a prototype weapon as well. Using classified technology derived from research at Yokohama Base, the Empire had begun developing a TSF portable electromagnetic radiation induction launcher, otherwise known as the EML Type 99X. The railgun, as it was known, had never been tested in live combat. But the U.S.-Japan XFJ program was deploying under the ideal conditions to conduct its test firing. Despite pushback from several factions within the Imperial Ministry of Defense, the proposal was pushed forward by Lieutenant Colonel Iwaya Aiji of the Imperial Army and First Lieutenant Takamura Yui of the Imperial Royal Guard, who served as a lead developer for the XFJ program. In the end, Testing the railgun was approved and added to the testing schedule of the Kamchatka expedition. In Kamchatka, the first phase of the UN Third Force's tests were met with considerable setbacks. Soviet troops in the region were overextended, overworked, and still had not received the reinforcements they desperately needed. Now they were expected to stretch their forces even further in order to provide accommodations and battlefield escorts to the UN test flights. This resentment to the UN forces reached ahead when the African Union's test team, Duma Flight, was nearly eliminated during their combat trials. All members of Duma were rookies who had never engaged the beta previously. With the African Union's refusal to allow for the use of combat stimulants and post-hypnotic suggestions on their surface pilots, None of the members of Duma Flight could be treated when panicking in the middle of battle. Instead, the lives of their more experienced Soviet escorts would be lost in order to ensure the survival of the floundering UN team. 
Now bearing the poor reputation garnered from the expedition's first phase, the second phase began on August 3rd, 2001. The Chinese, Soviet, and multinational UN test flights and their support staff would arrive at the Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky base, later stationing themselves at the Tsefor supply base under Major General Balakin's command. The next time a beta incursion occurred in Kamchatka, they stood ready to deploy and conduct their combat trials. Because the beta were known to follow predictable patterns of behavior, Soviet forces only anticipated two possible routes to account for. The overland route, which was heavily defended by bases to the north, or the sea route, which led directly to the Tagilsky coastline. Furthermore, the Soviet Air Force was able to regularly deploy formations of both Tu-22s and Tu-95 bombers in the region. This was due to the early development stages of the nearby Avensk Kyiv, which had not grown enough to begin fielding the dreaded laser class. The Beta would pose no threat to TSFs or aircraft at high altitude in Kamchatka. By August 8, 2001, Low Earth Orbit satellites had detected two beta groups entering the Sea of Okhotsk, arriving from further inland and emerging from within the Avensk Hive. While Group F continued to increase in size by combining with trailing groups, Group K combined with a large-scale herd of beta already resting upon the seabed. A coastal incursion was inevitable, and beta advance groups were soon to be expected. General Balakin Lieutenant Colonel Latrova's forces would be responsible for not only defending the region, but ensuring the safety of all UN personnel. In order to accomplish this, the strategy for the upcoming engagement consisted of establishing two primary defense lines. After contact, once the beta herd was diminished within manageable numbers, the Soviet forces would allow a battalion-sized herd to approach the second defense line. From that point, the UN forces would be cleared to conduct their combat tests in a live but relatively controlled combat environment. For the Argus flight, this meant deploying the prototype radiation cannon. On August 13th, the vanguard of Beta Group K was detected off the coastline via sensor relays. They would once again be making landfall in the Tagilsky region. Soviet and UN TSFs were already standing by at their designated positions, prepared to meet this advance. But Soviet tank units that day, which still suffered from the attrition of previous engagements, were slow to deploy. The engagement began with a coordinated death charge strike by the Soviet Navy, just as the Beta passed below them along the ocean floor. This only partially hindered the advancing swarm, whose numbers more than made up for a momentary death in their advance. When the first wave of destroyer-class beta emerged from the sea, a saturation attack of land-based artillery, naval gunfire, and aerial bombardment began decimating the coastline. Although the barrage was a violent and destructive display of humanity's firepower, the beta mindlessly continued their advance through the kill zone, undeterred by their mounting losses. Guarding the second defense line were T-80s supported by attack helicopters. Unfortunately, the companies north of Tsar Battalion were unable to lay down a heavy enough volume of fire to hamper the enemy advance. With their only reinforcements having been composed of survivors and rookie crews hastily thrown together, it didn't take long for them to begin an uncoordinated retreat. This would threaten to derail the entire battle plan. Tsar Battalion moved to engage and provided cover for the tank companies to retreat. Meanwhile, the UN's Bao Fang flight, under the command of Lieutenant Kui Yifei, was cleared to begin combat testing and wasted no time in engaging the beta advance within the southern sector. Edo flight, which was testing only a single TSF, piloted by Lieutenants Inya Sistina and Kriska Barshanella, began to engage as well successfully cutting a path through the beta with unprecedented levels of aggression. Argus Flight, under the command of Lieutenant Yuya Bridges, remained stationary and waited for the opportunity to fire the Type 99 railgun. Unable to engage himself, he nonetheless repositioned his unit to an elevated location. This allowed the other TSFs in his flight 
to provide overwatch and engage the beta with supporting fire. As the fighting carried on, the Zara Battalion began sustaining casualties while they delayed the enemy pursuit. But it wasn't long until another push of beta threatened to encircle Lieutenant Colonel Latrova from the south, a maneuver which didn't escape the notice of Argus flight. From their overwatch position, they were able to successfully coordinate the withdrawal of both the tank companies and the Tsar Battalion before being granted permission to initiate the test firing of the railgun. All units along the defense line were cleared of the weapons line of fire as Tsar Battalion took to the skies above the battlefield. With the Beta now rapidly advancing across the entire defense line, Argus-1 began the firing sequence for the Type 99. In a blinding flash, a massive beam of radiation shot out from the long-range weapon, cutting a path of destruction over the entire coastline. The Beta incursion was wiped out in a matter of seconds. With its first shot, the EM radiation induction cannon silenced the battlefield. Observing personnel were unable to believe what they'd witnessed. Beta attacks had been repelled one after another before, but the introduction of this weapon convinced many that a true victory was closer at hand than they previously believed. For the first time in a long time, morale soared throughout the UN and Soviet ranks. Having suffered only minimal losses, the Soviet TSFs mopped up the battlefield. UN forces reconvened at the Sephora supply base. Both troops wasted no time in celebrating their decisive victory. For killing over 3,000 Beta in a single shot during his first combat sortie, Lieutenant Yuya Bridges, an American surface pilot, was awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, personally receiving the distinction by Major General Balakin. The prototype weapon had performed with devastating effect against the Beta. Leaders from all organizations which had witnessed its performance took immediate interest in the results of the test firing. In Japan, military leaders were satisfied with the data, although they remained concerned at the exposure of classified technology to the eyes of the Soviet Union. Further testing of the railgun would prove to be impossible, however, as it was rendered inert after its first test and would need to undergo maintenance in order to deploy again. For the XFJ program, this stroke of poor timing left the weapon inoperable by the time of the next beta attack. The assigned detachment of Imperial Japanese mechanics were unable to access the weapon's black box components, and the Japanese government had made the decision not to send any personnel who were qualified to remedy the issue. By August 15th, the remnants of Beta Group K had combined with other herds advancing behind them. Their numbers replenished at a rapid rate, and the herd was once again detected advancing along the bottom of the Gulf of Shadokov. A second landfall upon the Tegilsky coast was inevitable. Aware of this, the Soviet army finally addressed their previous lack of tanks, supply, and personnel. Now having had the time to recuperate, Soviet troops were put on high alert and quickly re-established the same defensive lines as before. Unlike the previous engagement, they were now more than capable of holding their ground and supporting the mission of the UN expedition. By August 19th, a brigade-sized force of Beta was rapidly nearing the projected landing coordinates. While the herd was likely larger in number than official readings could detect, it was clear that Beta Group K was smaller in size than it had originally been. The UN test flights once again assumed their positions on the field, with Baofeng to the south, Argus in the center, and Edel to the north. They were once again escorted by Soviet Army TSFs, tasked to ensure their survival during the course of the mission. As the Beta emerged once again, the coastline was turned into a kill zone of artillery and crossfire. The conditions were ideal for the UN forces, all of whom began their scheduled combat tests. In the southern sector, Lieutenant Yi Fei of Baofeng was eager to outdo the performance of Argus. Her unit advanced into the oncoming Beta and was the first of the test flights to engage. To the north, the Edel flight began engaging as well. Once again, 
they only committed their lead TSF into the fight, testing the capabilities of the prototype SU-37 Terminator with ruthless efficiency. Argus flight engaged as well, this time field testing a pair of F-15 Active Eagles, piloted by other members of the unit. After an hour of combat, the Beta were reduced to well within manageable numbers. In a brief moment of irony for the UN, the amount of Beta specimens remaining on the field was proving inadequate to sustain any further testing. Both Argus and Baofeng were quickly running out of targets to engage. Eagle flight, with a single TSF, managed to eliminate over 800 Beta single-handedly, completing their trial objectives. Morale was high, but it held a tenuous status over the battlefield. At the Sephora supply base, while Soviet leadership had heeded General Balakin's request to reinforce the tank companies, they had never provided the resources needed to close the underground tunnels, which had been dug by the Beta in the offensive one month prior. Had the tunnels been completed, Soviet observation posts would have detected the underground vibrations of an Army Corps-sized Beta herd rising to the surface from below. Instead, with only a few seconds of sensor warning to alert them, the Soviets were stunned to see a new incursion of Beta pouring onto the battlefield from a point only 13 kilometers northwest of the base. The tide of battle quickly turned back in favor of the Beta. In a panic, Soviet command issued an immediate evacuation of the forward supply base. To compound matters, issues with wide area data link communications suddenly increased, combining with confusion when separate chains of command exchanged orders between the UN and Soviet forces, scrambling to stabilize the situation. Eventually, the UN personnel agreed to follow the evacuation orders of the Soviet army. But this order would never reach many of the frontline units in a timely manner. Most of the troops fighting at the front were only aware that a beta attack had come from underground, somewhere near the base. Thinking quickly, the Soviet Central Strategic Development Corps' officer in charge, Lieutenant Colonel Budimir Rogovsky, proposed a plan to cordon off the supply base using Soviet TSF forces that were being held in reserve. A new command post would be set up 50 kilometers from the abandoned base, while a squadron of Tu-95 bombers would sortie and level everything in the kill zone around it. This would allow friendly forces to return and reclaim the facilities once the area was secured. As there were no laser class sighted in Kamchatka, the use of such heavy air support made the strategy feasible. Rogovsky's proposal was put forth under General Balakin's authority, and the Soviet leaders agreed. On the front lines, only the Baofeng flight had received the order to retreat. They were provided a designated rally point and departed the battlefield to rendezvous with their UN support staff. Edo flight fell under the command of the Central Strategic Development Corps and were ordered by Rogovsky's staff to assist in the Soviet Army's cordon. Meanwhile, still unaware of the full situation, Tsar Battalion was given standby coordinates. Regrouping her forces, Lieutenant Colonel Latrova was able to link up with Zarya and Zalezo squadrons and prepared to redeploy in direct defense of the supply base. This left Argus Flight outside of communication with their UN command staff, most of whom were in the process of being evacuated by Soviet troops. Without any escort or instructions to evacuate, they were left to remain on standby at their current position. Back at the Sephora supply base, Evacuation efforts were growing increasingly urgent. The majority of Beta forces which had emerged were now barreling toward the defenseless facilities. Only two companies of T-80s stood between the advancing herd and the base. These outnumbered tanks fought a desperate holding action, soon finding themselves in close combat with the overwhelming swarm. As the evacuation efforts neared completion, Two members of the Imperial Japanese military disobeyed the orders to retreat and elected to remain behind. The UN XFJ program's lead developer, First Lieutenant Yui Takamura and Corporal Yamamoto, a technician from the IJA, had barricaded themselves within Hangar 18 of the supply base. Within the hangar was the Type 99 railgun, which remained the property of the Japanese military. Lieutenant Takamura intended to remain behind and destroy the prototype weapon. 
as a highly classified project, it couldn't simply be abandoned for the Soviet forces to find upon reclaiming the base. And the TSF, which had been equipped to carry the weapon, was currently deployed within Argus flight. Thus, their only option was to dispose of the weapon and deny its classified data from being leaked. Before long, the tank companies defending the supply base were quickly overrun. With the Beta advance unchecked, the pair would be the only personnel remaining. Far to the coastline, where most of Beta Group K had been eliminated, Argus Flight was able to make limited contact with their support staff, receiving just enough intel to inform them of the Japanese personnel from their unit who'd been left behind. Acting independently, Argus initiated a rescue attempt into the Beta-infested sector. Argus 2 and 3, the Active Eagles, had been conducting that day's combat tests and were already low on field. They were ordered to leave what weapons and ammo they could and then retreat to safety. Argus 1 was the prototype XFJ-01 Shirinui II, piloted by Lieutenant Bridges, and Lieutenant Stella Bremer piloting a Strike Eagle was Argus 4. These two UN pilots would remain on the field, immediately proceeding toward Lieutenant Takamura's last known position. At Hangar 18, Beta Scouts, comprised of small and medium-sized strains, had already entered the base. It wasn't long until Lieutenant Takamura's position came under initial attack from the Beta. Using anti-material rifles, small arms, and even maintenance vehicles, both Takamura and Yamamoto were able to repulse the probing advances of tank and soldier class beta, but it wouldn't be long until an overwhelming amount of soldier class forced their way into the hangar. Arriving at the Tsif 4 base, Argus 1 and 4 were closing in on the surrounded personnel. Argus 4 landed on top of the base's air traffic control tower to provide overwatch, while Argus 1 proceeded to hangar 18 to initiate the rescue. During the intense ground fighting, Corporal Yamamoto was killed in action, and Lieutenant Takamura was wounded. But with two TSFs now reinforcing them, the Beta were neutralized and the railgun was temporarily secured. Argus-1 was forced to dismount from his TSF in order to provide first aid and help the wounded Lieutenant Takamura climb on board. Argus-4 continued to provide sniper cover, firing high explosive rounds at the base's fuel depot and neutralizing a portion of the advancing beta with the ensuing detonation. Argus Flight, having managed to recover one of the two missing personnel, was able to destroy the railgun using their TSF weaponry. The beta continued to swarm the base and encircle their position, and communications deteriorated even further. Launching signal flares and tactically withdrawing, a pair of TSFs fought a hectic battle throughout the abandoned structures of the base. Larger strains of Beta closed in around them, successfully damaging Argus-1. During a lull in the fighting, Lieutenant Bridges was able to transfer the wounded Takamura over to Argus-4. Engaging the Beta once more, Argus-4 was able to take off and finally escape from the battlefield, while the damaged Argus-1 continued to engage destroyer and grappler class beta in close range combat. Meanwhile, the Tsar Battalion had received orders to advance and defend the Sif-4 supply base. They stemmed the tide of beta entering the base, and upon seeing the signal flares of Argus flight, Lieutenant Colonel Latrova ordered her unit to fight their way directly into the base, where they managed to reinforce the embattled Argus-1. The Tsar Battalion took up multiple positions in and above the base, securing it and destroying any groups of Beta they could find. As the Tsar Battalion gradually retook the base and hunkered down into a defensive posture, the Soviet Air Force's 27th Bomber Squadron had finally arrived over the Kamchatsky region. The Tu-95s were rapidly approaching the base in order to provide some much-needed air support. In a tragic case of poor battlefield coordination amid the fog of war, the Soviet bombers had received orders to level the abandoned facilities in order to eliminate the Beta, believed to be overrunning the position. It was directly in contrast to Lieutenant Colonel Latrova's orders, which were to defend the abandoned base. Even with the Tsar Battalion's unit markers indicating friendly positions on the ground, the Tu-95s of Grom Squadron initiated a bombardment of the combat area, causing severe damage to everything below. 
The veteran TSF pilots struggled to avoid the bombers, having expected the bombardment to hit the rear lines of the Beta instead, further from their position. Multiple TSFs and their pilots were lost because of the mistaken attack. To compound the already disastrous situation for Soviet forces, yet another crushing blow would be delivered by the Beta. Within seconds of the bombing run, beams of radiation suddenly cut across the skies, emerging from a point northwest of the base. One by one, the invaluable heavy bombers were blown out of the sky, eliminated before they could even complete their attack run. The dreaded laser clasp had finally appeared on the Kamchatka battlefield, rendering all air support across the region ineffective. Even as the carpet bombing had battered parts of the Beta herd, the incursion continued with fury. With a cluster of laser class confirmed to the northwest, Lieutenant Colonel Latrova immediately rallied the survivors of her battalion. The fighting would only continue to tip in the enemy's favor unless a critical decision was made. Assigning two of her own to carry the damaged Argus One out of the battlefield, she then prepared her troops to initiate a daring laser guide against the Beta. In spite of the constant miscommunications with Allied units, the demoralizing friendly fire incident, and the exhausting levels of attrition they'd suffered, Latrovo recognized that with the loss of the Tsefor base, a critical gap would remain open in the Far East defense lines. Kamchatka would be all but lost unless her forces could retake the initiative. With one last effort, Tsar Battalion made a final advance into the swarm of Beta, targeting the cluster of laser class at the rear. Latrova herself would remain at the rear guard to coordinate with approaching Soviet units, who by then had been given orders to advance against the Beta as well. The fighting soon spread from the base, extending out to the epicenter of the underground incursion point. The Tsar Battalion took heavy losses as the Beta surrounded them on all sides, but cutting their way into the herd, they were able to successfully destroy all of the laser class which had appeared to the northwest. The rest of the Soviet forces advanced behind them, including Edel Test Flight, which charged ahead into the combat zone. Further details of the engagement remain unclear, but the Tsar Battalion fought to the bitter end, cut off from their allies. Lieutenant Colonel Latrova was presumed KIA, and her battalion was lost. The Soviet army, however, had managed to seize the momentum she created and proceeded to wipe out the remaining Beta. The Far East Front would hold. The surface pilots of Tsar were all hailed as heroes of the Soviet Union, awarded the distinction after having laid their lives down for the USSR. General Balakin was held to blame for the airstrike, which had resulted in the destruction of friendly units and his own supply base. He was forced to resign his post, and he promptly disappeared in order to protect himself from being tried by leaders of the Communist Party. For the UN troops, all of the test flights were able to regroup at Kamchatsky base. With the presence of laser class in the region now confirmed, the combat trials were suspended, and the expedition was ordered to return back to their home base in Alaska. The Japanese found themselves acutely involved with the foreign situation in the case of their prototype, which had demonstrated a groundbreaking level of effectiveness against the Beta. Its presence in Kamchatka had resulted in the only Japanese casualty during the battle. Corporal Yamamoto, who, of his own accord, had willingly disobeyed the Soviet order to evacuate the base and abandon the weapon, gave his life in an effort to ensure its destruction and to protect military secrets vital to the Empire. It is said that he fought the Beta on foot, using whatever small arms he had available. He engaged them alone in the maintenance tunnels below the base, as well as within the railgun's hangar itself. Upon being surrounded by dozens of soldier-class Beta, he ensured the safety of his commanding officer before successfully detonating a container of explosives. His deeds remain immortalized and are without a doubt the highest execution of duty for a soldier within the ranks of the Imperial Japanese Army. For Soviet troops remaining on the Kamchatka Peninsula, the battle was far from over. With the sacrifices of Tsar Battalion and many others like it, they had managed to delay the ever-encroaching spread of humanity's enemy. Yet combat along the Far East Front only intensified 
as the Beta were now supplemented by strains of laser glass. The fighting in the region would continue for months, and the Evansk Hive was but one front among many in the great struggle against the Beta. Future videos will continue to cover other events and locations in humanity's ongoing war against the Beta, so be sure to like and subscribe.